Airplanes, glamour, a fight for national independence, and the director of one of the 20th century's most iconic films. It's the history of the Kosh Chiushko Squadron. Hello and welcome to Footnoting History. I'm Lucy, and on this episode, I will be talking about the remarkable and flamboyant history of the Kosciuszko Squadron. The Kosciuszko Squadron was comprised of an international group of pilots who defied politicians, fought cavalry regiments, partied hard, and were pulled together by none other than Marion C. Cooper, later famous and semi infamous as the director of King Kong, the formative monster movie of 1933 Hollywood. I found out about this first via another podcast, What's in the Basket, because I love both feminist commentary and classic movies. Once I found out about it, I had to know more. A shout out here to Tia Farmer, the interlibrary loan librarian who helped me get and renew multiple obscure monographs in pursuit of this quest. Everything I have found convinces me that more research should be done. So this is going to be one of those podcast episodes where I say someone with access to relevant archives who's looking for a research subject should definitely take this on. The challenges of research into this topic have a lot to do with 20th century historical memory. Understandably, the First World War was cataclysmic enough that the revolutions and upheavals that followed in its wake have tended to fade in comparison, especially in the historical memory of countries not directly affected by them. In the case of the Polish-Soviet Wars specifically, its memory was obscured largely because of Soviet control of Poland from 1939 to 1989 during which time records of how resolutely that domination had been resisted were not only unpopular with the Soviet government, but actively squashed. Much of the work that's been done on the history of the Kosciuszko Squadron so far has been done either by amateur historians, people who are primarily politicians or journalists or something else, or by old school military historians. I say old school military historians because I know there is a lot of really interesting work being done in the field of military history these days, as scholars look at technology and gender and economics and how all of these things intersect with the history of wars and those who fight them. However, the kind of military histories I was looking at here contain a lot of blow by blow descriptions of maneuvers. And while these are valuable records, they don't tell me about the social history I want to explore. I have read through so many paragraphs about types of planes and types of hangars and weapons technology. So many. But what I really wanted to know was, what did these men think they were doing? And how were their activities perceived at the time? My first working research question was this. Was the formation of the Kosciuszko Squadron a gesture of Polish-American solidarity and or an expression of Polish-American identity? The answer to both of those options is less than you might expect. It's certainly less than I expected. True, that solidarity is suggested by the squadrons being named after revolutionary war hero Tadeusz Kosciuszko, and the formation and activities of the squadron have been interpreted in that light in subsequent decades. One of its histories, written by a Polish attaché to the New York embassy shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union, is titled Kosciuszko, We Are Here, riffing on that famous declaration of an American colonel visiting the tomb of the Marquis de Lafayette, that other international hero of the American Revolution, during World War I. And the Polish-American community was very enthusiastic about the activities of the squadron at the time. When the possibility of having an official U.S. program for volunteering in the war was floated in 1918, Polish language newspapers in the U.S. responded enthusiastically. Although no such program came into existence, the 1922 memoir of the combat written by Marion Cooper, the co-founder of the squadron, was translated into Polish and printed in Chicago, perhaps the major hub of the Polish-American community, that same year. And it's true that Poland's attempt to establish itself as an independent, modern nation in this moment of collapsing empires was embraced by the American pilots as echoing the narrative of the Revolutionary War in which Kosciuszko fought. But at the outset, what was going on was a bit more complicated and, to my mind, more interesting. Another narrative I don't see strong evidence for is the brave fight of Americans against the terrible threat of international Bolshevism. 
Sepulchral tones and capital letters both definitely implied in the writing of the military historians who wrote about it in the first half of the 20th century. But remember, those historians are writing when the Cold War is, so to speak, heating up, and Stalinism is at its brutal worst. So narratives of an international communist threat are anachronistically imposed onto that moment in the aftermath of the First World War. Understandably, similar narratives have been crafted in Polish histories of the squadron written after the fall of the Soviet Union, when Poland was finally, again, an independent nation. This is also true of one translated history of the squadron. In English, that history is Flight of Eagles. In Polish, it's Debt of Honor, and appears in a series of military histories subtitled Zapomniani Bohaterowie, Forgotten Heroes. I'll get to who these forgotten heroes were in a bit, but first, I think it's important to provide some big picture historical context. Poland had been infamously partitioned in the 18th century and divided between empires ever since. The Victorian historian Macaulay, writing in the late 19th century, called that partition one of modernity's infamous political crimes. It was in the aftermath of this partition, in fact, that Kościuszko staged an ultimately unsuccessful uprising. But the reason that partition is relevant to this early 20th century history is that between the armistice of November 11th, 1918, and the Versailles Conference of 1919 to 1920, there was a lot of time in which Poland, along with other states suddenly not part of empires anymore, was on its own in figuring out exactly where its modern boundaries should be. The approach of the Allied powers was basically to say, nobody worry about it, you'll all get self-determination just wait until we've had this meeting at Versailles. This is easy to say when you aren't a provisional government between a volatile post-imperial Germany on one side and Bolshevik Russia on the other, to say nothing of other neighboring states that also have brand new provisional governments. Poland, in short, was on its own. It also wasn't where you will find Poland on a map today since Poland basically got shunted westward after 1945. The campaigns of the Polish-Soviet War extended into what is now Belarus and what is now the western part of Ukraine. The creation of the Western Ukrainian People's Republic, in fact, based in Lviv, then Lvov, was resisted by Polish troops. At one point, the Polish general Piłsudski even pushed as far as what is now Lithuania, as part of his aim to create a sort of pan-Slavic coalition state that could serve as a buffer between post-imperial Germany and Soviet Russia. I know. It's a lot. I mention all this because I think it helps make clear why none of the Central European powers were thrilled about being told to sit tight and wait for the Versailles Conference to conclude. When the Versailles Conference did conclude, it notably refused to set any fixed borders in Central Europe at all. From the vantage point of 1919, this makes sense. The Allied powers looked at a linguistically, ethnically, and religiously diverse region and said, you know what? Figure out what you want. Work it out amongst yourselves. This especially makes sense given the fact that, infamously, the responses of European empires to Serbian attempts at nationalist self-determination had set World War I off in the first place. Of course, just over a century later, it's easy to say, okay, I guess, but also this sets the stage for 1938 and 1939, and the 1990s, and you get the idea. So once again, history is complicated. The activities of the Kościuszko squadron, notably, were not backed by the US government. From late 1918 onwards, there were repeated efforts on both sides of the Atlantic to get official US support for Poland's fight for independence. Committees were formed in Warsaw and Chicago. Draft agreements to accommodate volunteers were drawn up. But both the Treasury and the State Department of the U.S. were resistant, as was President Woodrow Wilson himself. Now, Ignacy Jan Paderewski, who would become Poland's prime minister in 1919, had persuaded Wilson to include Poland specifically in his famous, or infamous, 14 points speech. It was point number 13. And I think it's worth quoting here, both because of what it does say and what it doesn't. Quote, An independent Polish state should be erected, which should include the territories inhabited by indisputably Polish populations, which should be assured a free and secure access to the sea, 
and whose political and economic independence and territorial integrity should be guaranteed by international covenant. Unquote. If you're interested in either 20th century history or Eastern European history, you'll probably have noticed the trickiest bit there. Prizes to literally anyone who could identify in 1918 territories inhabited by indisputably Polish populations. Indisputably? There was so much dispute that interwar Poland included parts of what is now Ukraine and parts of what is now Germany. Also, you will notice that while Wilson says Poland's independence should receive international support, he says nothing about what that support should look like in practical terms. Relevant here is the fact that US involvement in World War I had been deeply unpopular and had infamously involved Wilson going back on his campaign promises. So getting involved in another conflict on foreign soil in a much more politically unstable environment was not something he was interested in. It was, however, a much more attractive prospect to wealthy, privileged young men who wanted to get involved in some good old-fashioned heroics with their excitingly modern airplanes. And while I'm being slightly flippant about this, as I tend to be about the desires of wealthy and privileged young men, this was both genuinely dangerous and acknowledged as genuinely valuable by the beleaguered government of the brand new Polish state. And the pay offered by the Polish army was terrible. Moreover, several of the pilots who first joined up explicitly identified their choice to do so as linked to their own sense of a historical debt owed to Poland by the US. Marion Cooper's family history commemorated his great-great-grandfather as having fought next to Kazimierz Pulaski, who was introduced to George Washington by Benjamin Franklin and was the first leader of the US cavalry. Kenneth Murray, a member of the squadron who later wrote a history of the war, framed the activities of himself and his comrades as repaying, but only in part, the actions of Pulaski and Kościuszko, who, in his words, gloriously bared their swords in the cause of our American independence. And it's worth mentioning that Pulaski and Kościuszko not only fought for American independence, but also against the 18th century Russian Empire, so they were understandably icons to the Polish members of the squadron as well. About half of the members of the Kościuszko squadron, aka the Polish-American Air Group, aka Siódma Eskadra Lotnica, were Polish, and we can see them as understandably inspired by patriotic fervor. Like Kościuszko himself, passionate about Polish identity even and especially when that identity was not accompanied by national independence. These airmen included those who had recently been prisoners of war in Russia and those who held traditional titles of nobility and saw this as the most appropriate way of fulfilling their obligations to their country. And then there were the Americans and a few Brits. Some of these men were veterans of World War I. All of them were members of an informal international fraternity of airmen. And this, I think, is an important factor in the formation and activities of the squadron. Remember, at the time of the formation of this squadron, we are less than 20 years out from the Wright brothers' flight at Kitty Hawk. So flight technology is new and shiny and also very dangerous. And all of these things contribute to the glamour of the men who fly planes. Yes, even this early, there are some women. But the image of the heroic airman is a very masculine one. For an illustration, I encourage you to look up the career and the absolutely incredible jawline of Ludwig Ijikowski, who originally flew with the Kościuszko squadron. This man could have played himself in the movie of his life. And this heroic glamour, even when not accompanied by heroic jawlines, was not necessarily linked to flying planes in war. The key thing was the willingness to risk one's life flying a machine that was simultaneously extremely fragile and extremely powerful. So there's this shared subculture that draws the men together. And in Marion Cooper's memoir of the squadron, the emphasis is not on the sacred fight against Bolshevism or on the noble and freedom-loving Americans helping the equally noble and freedom-loving Poles, but chiefly on what he frames as adventures and hijinks. A History of the Squadron, written by one of its former members in 1932, describes this as the myriad incidents of young pilots in an old country. I'm not entirely sure what those myriad incidents are, but I'm assuming they involve considerable quantities of vodka. I don't mean to dismiss either the idealism or the physical courage of the men involved, but there is a distinctive swashbuckling element both to their wartime activities and to their memoirs. 
Cooper wrote with some pride that the squadron served both as reconnaissance and rearguard in multiple actions, augmenting both Polish firepower and Polish military intelligence in a war with constantly shifting frontiers. Edmund Graves, the first pilot to be killed, was not killed in action, but when his plane crashed into the Potoki Palace in Lviv during a demonstration. I know this seems like a weird fact, and it is, but I mention it in order to re-emphasize the ways in which flying itself was risky during this period. The kind of flying these men were doing is not the kind of flying that would be done by pilots in the Second World War. Reconnaissance and bombing flights were done consistently in the same planes. Also, the technology at this point was such that on more than one occasion, planes swept in to help out Polish cavalry regiments facing Soviet machine guns. One of the chief criteria for recruitment to the squadron, in this moment when the planes of the Polish Air Force consisted of whatever planes they could get their hands on, was experience in flying different kinds of machines, French, British, German, Italian. Murray, in his squadron history, records enthusiastically the landmark occasion when Shrewsbury completed an entire 90-minute flight without having his engine falter once. The pilots often commented on the fact that they could see, from the air, peasants gazing up at their planes. And for all the platitudes about the essential nobility and beauty of peasant character are just that, the fact remains that the Kosciuszko squadron did enjoy significant popular support. Support that was significant not only to their success, but sometimes to their very survival. The squadron was formally discharged from service days after the Treaty of Riga was signed on May 3rd, 1921, putting an official end to the war. The officers of the squadron were awarded Poland's oldest military decoration, the Virtuti Militari. This honor came along with a plot of land, but the Americans donated theirs in order to form a site for a Polish military hospital. They returned home accompanied by a farewell order from Stanisław Jesenski, commander of the Air Force, in which he commended their sacrifices paid in blood, their endurance in the hour of trial, praising them for accomplishing deeds which Kosciuszko himself set out to achieve. This and all of our footnoting history episodes are available captioned on our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and special thanks to all of you who help support us via Ko-fi and Patreon. Until next time, remember, the best stories are in the footnotes. <laughs>